All right, welcome everyone to the Yogic Studies podcast. This is episode 33. I'm your host, Seth Powell. And today we have the pleasure of being joined by Dr. Stuart Sarbacher, who is Associate Professor of Philosophy and Religion in the School of History, Philosophy and Religion at Oregon State University. Stuart, welcome back to the Yogic Studies podcast. It's great to have you here. Thanks so much, Seth. It's great to be back. Yeah. We had you on the podcast. I had to look this up last uh, January 2001. So right there in the in the middle of the pandemic. Thank goodness that's over, right? Uh, mm. Just kidding. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> uh, that was episode 17. And uh, the, on that episode, we got to celebrate and discuss your recent book, which at the time I don't think I actually had a physical copy of, but now I can actually hold up. Mm. I have this wonderful book uh, here um, in the material form here, Tracing the Path of Yoga, the History and Philosophy of Indian Mind, Body, Discipline. So so that episode, we did a deep dive into, mm. I mean, really all things yoga, history, and philosophy, because the book you know, is comprehensive in that way. Mm-hmm. Um, but in that episode, we also got to do a deep dive into you and your story, your background. So we won't do that as much today. And I invite listeners, viewers to go back to episode 17 and check that out. Um, it was a really rich podcast. And so I think, uh, I think if you're here, I think you're the kind of person who would also enjoy that. Uh, but for uh, new listeners, Stuart, why don't we begin, just tell us a little bit about yourself um, and, and the work that you do. Sure. So, as, as you mentioned, I'm a, an associate professor here of, I often say comparative religion and Indian philosophy here at Oregon State University. And so I, I kind of wear a number of different hats. Um, one is really teaching introductory courses on world religions, introduction to Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam, and then upper division courses that often revolve around my deep interests in yoga and tantric traditions. And so my research on the sort of the broader scope of things is really focused principally on the history and philosophy of yoga. And I'm, I'm particularly interested in looking at the way that modern and contemporary practices can be sort of put within the perspective of the larger historical arc of yoga, which is part of the reason I was so excited about having the opportunity to teach the course on the eight limbs of yoga, because this is exactly the type of work that I just absolutely love to do really look at the way that a particular practice evolves over time and the way in which modern and contemporary practitioners frame a practice and kind of put that into conversation with its history. Yeah, so Stuart's going to be offering a new course here at Yogic Studies titled Eight Limbs of Yoga, History, Theory, and Practice of Ashtanga Yoga. So that's really what we're going to be talking about here today, all things Ashtanga Yoga. Mm-hmm. So to, to jump into this really rich and fascinating topic, you know, when someone hears this phrase today, Ashtanga Yoga, at least within the contemporary yoga world, I imagine well, there, there's sort of two things that might come to mind around this phrase, Ashtanga Yoga. Either the system of yoga that was outlined by Patanjali, you know, roughly 1500 years ago in his Yoga Sutra or the Patanjali Yoga Shastra, the sort of classical model of Ashtanga Yoga. Mm. Or probably even more commonly, I think when people just in the general public hear of Ashtanga Yoga, they actually think of a particular modern style of postural yoga, maybe called Ashtanga Vinyasa or just Ashtanga Yoga. Those who practice it might even be called Ashtangis. Mm-hmm. Um, so how do you, as a scholar, as a teacher, how do you kind of differentiate these two different Ashtanga yogas? And and we should acknowledge, too, for some people uh, today, certainly there is no distinction. These mm-hmm. These are perhaps one and the same. But as a scholar, as a teacher, as a historian, scholar of religion, how do you understand uh, or approach this question? Yeah, well, Seth, you already hinted at, I think, part of the 
answer to that question, which is to look at yoga within the context of its larger historical development. You know, what did Ashtanga yoga mean in its classical context in the third to fifth century um, of the common era when Ashtanga yoga as a kind of formal yoga philosophy was first articulated versus how is it being represented in the contemporary context. Um, but you're also pointing to the difference between, say, a, a kind of philosophical and pragmatic framework for talking about yoga in general versus one particular modern lineage, which appeals to that very rubric. And so uh, Kate Patabi Joyce, um, in a number of interviews, I think made it perfectly clear that when he talked about his system, this very vigorous modern uh, system of vinyasa practice, when he talked about it as Ashtanga yoga, he was in fact referencing the classical model of Ashtanga yoga. And one of the things we'll look into in this course, which is I think, you know, extremely interesting, is the way in which practices are adapted and and are integrated within the Ashtanga model such that it is a kind of a fluid dynamic framework that over generations is transformed in all, all sorts of different ways. Another answer to the question would be to say, again, if we look to the way Patabi Joyce, the formulator of this Ashtanga Vinyasa system, looks at it, is he argues that through this sort of dynamic postural practice, one can in fact incorporate all of the different limbs of yoga. And that ultimately it's targeted towards um, cultivating the kind of outer aspects of yoga that are visible and under our control as a platform for developing the inner limbs of yoga, which are kind of outside of our immediate control. And again, that points to both the classical framework, but in some respects also to certain Hatha yoga ideas that when you discipline the body, when you discipline the breath, the mind almost naturally enters into a kind of state of meditation. Now, a footnote to all of this is those of you who are familiar with Mark Singleton's work mm. will note that he suggests one possible reason why that Ashtanga rubric stuck was there's another Ashtanga that's quite well known within the Indian context, and that's the, the what's called the Sa Ashtanga Namaskar, mm -hmm. a kind of prostration or plank pose in which eight parts of the body touch the floor. So another connection to Ashtanga is really through the idea of a kind of physical practice in which one is prostrate on the ground. And those of you out there who are listening, who are vinyasa practitioners or Ashtanga vinyasa, are quite familiar, for example, with Chaturanga Dandasana, a kind of prostrative pose where you're down low on the ground. So there's another kind of perhaps genealogy to that Ashtanga that Singleton kind of teases us with. Right. Um, that may be part of the picture here as well. But the, but the bottom line is, it's, an, it's a great example of how the, this sort of classical framework of eight limbs continues to be a framework for understanding authoritative yoga practice in the modern context. Mm. We'll, we'll circle back to the more modern adaptations or... or um, uh, expressions of ashtanga yoga i think later uh in this episode but let's let's dig into the classical model of ashtanga yoga uh give us a, a bit of an introduction a, a brief overview of course we're going to go into this in uh, extensive detail in the course uh but but what is the classical model of ashtanga yoga all about yeah, so the the classical Ashtanga yoga, and really by classical here, we're referring to classical Hindu or classical priestly traditions that fall within the larger rubric of Hinduism. One could say there's also classical Buddhist and classical Jain ideas that all develop in the early centuries of the common era during an era of really a kind of 
cultural resurgence in India, especially around uh, Sanskrit culture, priestly traditions. So, so that's the context we're talking about if we're, we're talking about classical. Um, the important thing, though, is, is I think really zeroing in on this idea that Patanjali writing a sutra text, a kind of thread narrative that really provides us a core understanding of what the principles of yoga are within a larger sutra discourse. You know, many of us are familiar, for example, with the Kama Sutra, the sutra about pleasure or love, which in, there, instead of yoga, the discourse is about pleasure. So, within the Yoga Sutra, which is a classical text, you have uh, the an attempt to really get at what the bare bones of yoga are. And central to Patanjali's presentation is this framework of eight limbs, that if you want to pursue the goals that yoga sets forth, the, the key framework for doing this is a framework that has eight steps or eight stages. Yama, which means restraint, Niyama, which means observance, Asana or posture, Pranayama or breath control, Pratyahara, which is withdrawal of the senses, and then you have Dharana, the fixation of the mind on a particular object, like the breath, for example. Dhyana, the extension of that fixation into a kind of stream of awareness. And then lastly, Samadhi, a kind of state in which that concentration becomes perfected. And what's really important about this, and one of the things we'll go into in great detail in the class, is that each step of that path is seen to build upon the previous step. That as you master a practice of self-restraint, which is really about the relationships you have with the world, certain benefits accrue that really provide a foundation for the later stages. When you start to adjust your own lifestyle, um, the nyamas of, or observances are really about what you do privately, let's say. Um, Georg Fierstein liked to say, yama was what you did when other people were looking, and niyama was when no one else was watching, when you're by yourself. And likewise, when you master niyama, when you master asana, when you master pranayama, there's a kind of cumulative snowball-like effect that makes each next step a little bit easier, almost to the point of a kind of sponta spontaneous arising of the next limb. So that framework then is the grounds, according to Patanjali, for both achieving some extraordinary things in this world. And we can talk, of course, in detail, if you'd like, about this, what are the so-called yoga powers, the sort of extraordinary powers of perception and action that come out of yoga practice. But very importantly for Patanjali, this, this all provides a framework for achieving a kind of special knowledge or wisdom that liberates you from the pains and miseries associated with embodied existence. So that's it in a nutshell. Of course, there's so many more details. And that's, of course, one of the, you know, those are the sorts of things we're going to be hashing out Mm -hmm. at much more length in the course. So I'm, I'm sure that this is probably obvious to most of our, our listeners who are uh, maybe more advanced yoga geeks, yoga philosophy uh, connoisseurs, if you will, I, uh, I like to imagine, of our audience. Uh, so I'm sure most, most of you know that asana, you know, for Patanjali, looks quite different than asana as we know it today, you know, in the global transnational yoga scene, or even what we think of as yoga today. So tell us just a little bit uh, briefly, again, we'll go into this more, but, you know, what is asana for Patanjali within, mm -hmm. you know, this original Ashtanga model? Yeah, again, if we think about the practice of yoga as Patanjali has framed it within the context of Ashtanga yoga, as a kind of movement from the sort of outer experience to the inner experience. In fact, there are terms within the yoga tradition that reflect this. Um, the first is bahiranga, which means the outer limbs of yoga, and then the antaranga, the inner limbs. And the first five are the outer, 
the last three are the inner. And so uh, asana f falls within these outer limbs. And by outer, it doesn't necessarily mean less important. In some respects, without those outer limbs established, the inner limbs are going to be very, very difficult, if not impossible, to accomplish. So asana plays a critical role, really, in developing and mastering the outer limbs, and particularly the disciplining of body. Now, it's often said that, well, asana is not really that important. Only three verses are dedicated to it explicitly within the, the context of the Yoga Sutra or Yoga Shastra. Um, but I sort of want to flip the script on that and say, actually, in terms of talking about the Shtanga Yoga, Patanjali is very terse. In fact, three verses, in some respects, is a lot uh, mm -hmm. and is a substantive acknowledgement of the import of asana within the framework of the eight limbs. And so, really the way that it's framed there is in terms of the idea that that posture, as I think many of our audience probably know, should be stable and comfortable. That it involves, among other things, a kind of balancing of effort and relaxation. And that when it's perfected, one becomes a very stable and unlikely to be disturbed. Mm -hmm. And within the context of Ashtanga Yoga, this is in part to prepare a person for focused breath control, sense withdrawal, and meditation. But at the same time, I think we can really glean from that a principle that applies very much so to modern postural practice. I think most of us, if not all of us, who have, ha who have a serious postural practice you know, can really, I think, identify with the idea that when you practice postural yoga, balancing effort and relaxation is absolutely critical. That it is absolutely possible to practice posture way too aggressively and way too muscularly, if that's a, an expression. And then likewise, it's easy to be too lax about it as well. And I think what one finds with the kind of seasoned asana practice is that ability to find that kind of sweet spot between that kind of engagement and relaxation that leads to a kind of stability and a strength. And I think, you know, again, most of us have probably had this moment where we feel we got this asana. You know, we've sort of reached that point where of balance or reached a point where you realize you're, you have been putting way too much effort into this asana. And if you relax just a little bit, it just clicks. Now, that we can even take that further and say, this is a representation of one of the most critical elements of Patanjali Yoga and of Ashtanga Yoga. And that's the idea that there are two complementary forces in yoga practice. Abhyasa, which is a kind of effortful practice, and vairagya, which is a kind of dispassionate kind of de attitude of detachment. And those two together are kind of like the magical formula for, you know, reaching that point of equal equilibrium between working too hard and working too little, you know, that just right kind of place, which again, I think connects to this idea of perfecting whatever practice one is performing. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, I, I I agree. I think it's 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 now becoming overstated, oversaturated, if you will, to say that uh, asana has this you know denigrated role within Ashtanga Yoga and Patanjali system. Look, there's only three sutras out of 195. He didn't care about asana. Um, if we do look to the Bhashya, the earliest commentarial layer, right, whether it was written by Patanjali or not, we do get more information. We get actually our earliest list of asanas. If we do take that seriously uh, as an authoritative early list of what the sutra intended, then mm -hmm. we do know that all the, the asanas that are listed there are all seated postures for pranayama, Pratyahara, dharana, dhyana, samadhi, right? For, you know, breath control and, and meditation and highly, you know, absorbed states of concentration. Um, but that, that asana, unga, 
is mm. so so important. You, mm-hmm. you 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 cannot do the other ungas. You cannot progress, you know, through mm. this 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 ladder of ashtanga yoga unless that posture, that seat becomes stira sukham, mm-hmm. firm and 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 comfortable, easeful, you know. Mm. Um Pranayama just isn't going to happen. If you're sitting there, if you're fidgeting in your seat and moving around or you're in pain or you're hot or cold or hungry or thirsty, right? Um, you're not going to sit for very long to be able to, you know, control and extend your breath. You're not going to be able to withdraw your senses and you're not going to have, you know, any sustained focus for meditation. I think anybody who's tried to meditate for more than 20 seconds mm-hmm. knows how fidgety and uncomfortable the body can be right so that 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 asana even if even if it is simply simply right a seated asana what a difficult posture that is to perfect to maintain to hold in order to really deepen into these higher inner you know more prolonged states that the rest of the text and the system is really outlying yeah, and I want to just say a couple of things quickly to that. You know, one is just a, a quick story. So the first time I ever got into lotus position, which I will say does not come qu- quite easily or naturally to my body. You know, I've got kind of narrow hips and not a lot of external rotation. So it isn't a posture that you know, I pop in too easily. And, you know, in fact, I rarely see in that posture actually when i meditate i often sit in vajrasana um on a on a small seat um just because you know otherwise i'm just grappling with the discomfort in my body now years ago when i was practicing ashtanga vinyasa very intensely and doing so much of that you know daily external rotation of the hips i could get once i was warmed up into uh, that Padmasana somewhat comfortably. Um, I, I, I won't say I ever really felt great in mm-hmm. Padmasana, um, but, you know, I could get there. So, nonetheless, the first time actually I got into Padmasana, I was on a, a, a Vipassana retreat in the, the Gwenka tradition. And in fact, I was in Ghatpuri in India at the headquarters of Vipassana International, and Gwenka himself taught several units so that was a real sort of interesting experience to see him he was actually there in person he was there in Uh, person because normally you know at least since that time it's just through the the videos the recordings that you know that you watch those those instructions that's right and in fact in this particular retreat he gave some of the teachings and others were him were audio recordings of him teaching and i have to say they were very similar um, sure. But still, it's, so it's a around diff- around what year w- would that have been? This was in ninety six, nineteen ninety six. Okay, and so, um, so, but you know, he, he's he has some definite charisma, and you know, it was a it was quite interesting to have him there. But what I wanted to talk about though was basically we sat on a cement floor with these tiny little thin cushions. Mm-hmm. And let's just say I spent quite a bit of time, the fir- especially the first part of the retreat, just really dealing with a, an enormous amount of pain in my body. But about day six or day seven, I found my legs were starting to kind of naturally gravitate more and more to a kind of lotus style position until a certain point where sure enough, my legs sort of moved into that and you get and I got this sort of feeling like I'm more stable I'm kind of almost like a tripod or something like that it made it easier on my back and that really was instructive to me about um, you know the role of asana in practice and of course it became much easier to sit for these longer periods of time and in fact in at least at that point in time and I'm and I would be surprised actually if this is change there would be periods of an hour or more where you would be asked to not move at all you Mm -hmm. know to just try not to move at all during this period um and which leads to some sort of funny moments where you're like you know 
do I have 10 minutes left to go or do I have half an hour left to go? Like, this is going to be a long process. Um, in fact, at the end of it, I remember talking, it was actually a silent retreat, so people weren't talking too much. And at the end of the retreat, I was chatting with one of the other participants and he says, he, he said to me something to the effect of, oh, I saw all these lights and it was so blissful and I was at peace and et cetera. I'm like, were we on the same retreat? You know, I was <laughs> thinking, you know, dealing with so much physical pain. Of course, there were moments of, you know, intense clarity, moments of peace. And I think as the Vipassana method tends to do, moments where you kind of gain an ability to kind of just watch things develop and move in your body and not feel like you got to control or grab onto them or respond. Um, so there, there, and there was a bit of an emotional catharsis there, but it was definitely challenging. And I know some other Buddhist traditions criticize the Gwenka tradition as being too ascetic in orientation because it's not so accommodating to one's comfort. Um, so yeah, I've I, I've done a few of those back in my day as well, and so I'm kind of being flooded with my own memories oh, yeah. <laughs> of my experiences, and in, and in many ways they very much parallel everything that you just said. And I was a yeah. little bit more hardcore, even more ascetic, mm-hmm. if you will, in mm-hmm. my own yoga and meditation practice at that time. Oh yeah. And so I had a similar experience with Padmasana, building up to Padmasana in some of those Vipassana retreats, and got to a place where I was holding it for that full hour. Mm. But but before building up to that, it was sort of the situation where, well, you better choose your posture carefully, because if you're not going to move for a full hour, mm-hmm. and, you, and you, you, know, you bust out Padmasana too soon all of a sudden Mm. 10 minutes in and you're thinking oh my gosh what did i do there's no way there's no way i'm gonna make this i'm in you know but but there really are the waves of the mind Mm. um and you you know you experience those sensations they'll pass they might come back again with fury and anger (laughs) (laughs) um but but uh, what what an what an experiment on the mind and the body to put yourself in that sort of container uh, but but there is a danger of pushing oneself too far, and you know we there are so many stories of you know um, serious damaged knees and hips and mm-hmm, that sort of mm-hmm. thing by by doing that when one's not ready to or uh, so on and so forth. But but it's also true that you know by doing that kind of experiment, you know I, I kind of look at those vipassana retreats as almost like a you know, 10 days of like, it's not, it's not the exact same as Ashtanga Yoga of, of Patanjali, <laughs> but there's a lot of similarities in, in the ascetic nature, in the, I'm just going to commit myself full time to this contemplative practice. Um, there's certain, you know, kind of yama and niyama aspect to it as well of, a, you know, observances and restraints, the silence that one is undertaking throughout this whole thing, right? We won't, won't get into all the details of it, but it's almost like you get to step out of your normal life and you get to be sort of a professional yogi meditator ascetic for 10 days. Mm. Mm-hmm. And you get kind of a glimpse of what this stuff is really about. You know, the types of experiences that you can have in just a 10 day period. I mm. always imagine, well, what if you were doing that for 10 years, 20 mm-hmm. years, an entire life? Then you start reading chapter three. And, you know, the the Vibhuti Pada and some of these things start to maybe, um, you know, resonate a little bit more of the types of, um, you know, experiences that one can have with these high levels of, of absorption. Um, yeah, well, I was getting... going to say, I, you know, I like to use in, in various contexts the analogy of, say, running, you know, running a 5k versus a 50k you know these are very different levels of training and call on very different levels of training experience but also lend towards sort of different types of effects and experiences um one of the things though i wanted to just the the sort of second point i wanted to make that i want to come back to about this is as you were suggesting, you know, having a stable posture maybe means that hour is much more productive 
Yes. Or, you know, it, it, if nothing, it's, it's definitely more comfortable. And secondly, yes. perhaps you can do that Vipassana work in a way that you might not have if you were constantly attending to, the, to that pain in the body. Absolutely. I, I experienced that myself. At that time, I had a, a very regular, you know, and vigorous asana practice. And it was very apparent that, you know, in my own body, but also later in conversations with other meditators, it, you know, it was quite clear that those of us who kind of had that, it was a lot mm-hmm. easier to have that, you know, um, stable posture. Um, yeah. And, and I was going to say, in more generally, I think, and this is, again, something we'll go into in depth in the course, the yoga literature itself, I think, really, um, again and again, returns to the idea that these, you know, these various steps of yoga, rather than thinking of them as preliminaries for something later, are a critical part of the process. And that if they're done correctly, it actually makes these other practices either easier or just downright spontaneous. And so, one example might be, I go to a postural yoga class and I don't necessarily practice some sort of formal meditation, but through performing asana in a very sort of intelligent way, as Iyengar would like to say, balancing effort and relaxation, perhaps one enters into, if not meditation, a meditative-like state, and one perhaps leaves that yoga studio being less affected by what potentially would call the dvandvas, you know, the experience of, you know, hot and cold, but it might be other dynamics within one's personal or social life, that there's an ability to maybe tolerate, um, you know, some of the pressures that the world puts on you to move about with more equanimity because you found that dynamic within posture. So, there are benefits there. Likewise, you know, one of the things I've argued in some of my academic publications is that the rubric of tapas, of sort of disciplining the body, and that having a very powerful effect in the Indian tradition, I think applies in certain ways to very directly to postural practice. That when you um, bear that kind of adversity for a period of time, there's a kind of feeling of relief and catharsis that happens that sort of invigorates one. And one example would be, I'm not a, a very regular practitioner of hot yoga, for example, um, but I've dabbled with it on occasion. Um, in fact, I brought a group of students to a hot yoga class once at the end of a term. and. That was like the longest hour and a half of my life. That sounds um, da- dangerous. <laughs> it was it was tough, but I have to say, when I stepped out that door into the cool outside air, yeah, I felt great. You know, I really yeah. felt like I had been through something, and the rest of my day was a piece of cake. You know, yeah. compared to that intensity, that adversity I faced within that hour and a half. Which sure, again sure. resonates with some of this, I think, vipassana practice, where you know sometimes you spend an hour attending to discomfort in the body, and I think as you very um, astutely, you know, put, sometimes the the waves come and go, and yeah. you think you know this is done now, but then oh, here it comes back even more intensely than yeah. it did before. Yeah, you get very familiar with your stories that you tell yourself when you sit for yes. hours like that. <laughs> so the other thing, though, that, that that the Vipassana experience kind of brings up, I think, is that, you know, Patanjali's Ashtanga Yoga is not the only model, right? Hmm. There are other, and other early contemplative yogic meditative models hmm. uh, that aim at reducing or alleviating human suffering and even attaining some sort of uh, transcendence or liberation, uh, moksha, samadhi, nirvana, etc. So let's go back a little bit to this early history, thinking about this Ashtanga yoga model. Patanjali's you know, text is codifying all this at a particular moment, but it's certainly not the first yoga and it's not the the first system of yoga actually although sometimes it's hailed as such so 
tell us a little bit without giving too much away. Mm-hmm. Uh, save mm-hmm. you know, save some gems for the course for sure. But what were some? Do you think of the early influences for Patanjali's model of Ashtanga Yoga? Well, just to jump off this last point that you made, I think one very sort of direct correlation you can make, both in terms of the the philosophy and practice of yoga as Patanjali represents it, but also very likely with respect to historical influences and borrowings, is the relationship between the kind of uh, contemplative practices, particularly Um, the practice of dhyana or meditation, Mm -hmm. and the specific meditation subjects or objects that are used um, within Patanjali Yoga and, among other places, Buddhist tradition. So, for example, you know, paying attention to your sensations in Vipassana. Well, Patanjali lists paying attention to sensation as one potential way to develop a kind of unified state of mind in the first section of the Yoga Sutra. Likewise, he describes the use of the breath, but also objects like loving kindness and compassion. In fact, there's a set of four that appear in Patanjali, uh, Maitri, Karuna, Mudita, and Upeksha, which are basically friendliness or loving kindness, um, uh, compassion, sympathetic joy or um, what we might call sort of a uh, sort of moral uplift mm-hmm. and then lastly equanimity these appear not only in patanjali yoga but they appear as objects of contemplation both in buddhist and jain contexts. so it's clear there's an intimate relationship between those traditions and we'll definitely talk about that more but pushing it back even further I mean, we can go back to at least the Vedic tradition, the sort of very earliest sort of vestiges of the Hindu tradition that that we have sort of clear understanding of, because we've got textual traditions that were based upon very uh, carefully preserved oral traditions that tell us a lot about the life of early Hindu ritual practitioners. And within the locus of those uh, ritual practices were things like pranayama, breath control, were things like tapas, um, the uh, ascetic self-discipline, literally developing a kind of inner heat through practices of self-denial and self-mortification. But also, I think very importantly and often neglected in terms of the history of yoga, practices like svadhyaya, which was reciting texts, especially mantras, as a way to both discipline the mind and cultivate a kind of pious attitude. Mm. Um, so there, there are many different building blocks looking back at the earliest sort of recorded history. Now, some people push it back even further to the Indus civilization, and we'll touch on this a little bit because we have some archeological materials that perhaps suggest that yoga might even go back further. Um, I personally think this, you know, that is a very speculative road to go down, and we'll talk more about this in the course. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, you're absolutely right that uh, Patanjali really is coming into the game relatively late, but really bringing a kind of systemic or systematic coherence to yoga, drawing on what I like to call the building blocks of yoga that stretch way back into the most ancient periods of Indian history. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, more and more good scholarship has been coming out about some of these comparative aspects of the Brahminical, the Buddhist, the Jain, these sort of these early Shramana traditions and how some of those ideas are coalescing in the Yoga Sutra. Uh, <laughs> Bill Moss and Karen O'Brien Kopp, our, our colleagues who have, who have been doing great work on, on these topics. Um, you know, one of the things that for, for, for years and years always struck me, uh, and I still feel like there hasn't been quite enough work done on this, mm. is sort of just comparing, you know, Patanjali's Ashtanga Yoga, this eight-fold uh, system, to the Buddha's early teachings of the eightfold path, the Arya mm. Ashtanga Marga. There mm. you have, again, Ashtanga in Sanskrit. Uh 
I know that this is something that you'll touch on in the course, and we don't need to do like a full breakdown of every single you know, aspect of this, but do you think even just this, uh, the number eight and this mm. structuring of eight parts or eight means or auxiliaries to attain this soteriological goal, is there some significance across these traditions with, with that kind of scheme? Yeah, and I don't think it's a coincidence that Patanjali chose the eight. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. In part, it was because there was a clearly established, very influential, kind of perhaps even dominant model of religious yeah. practice in terms of this Ashtanga Marga or Ashtangika Marga. Um, this is, again, the language is so close. This is clearly the tradition that Patanjali was aiming to kind of codify within his own. Um, I think what's all, what's really interesting as well is that if you look at the Yoga Sutra, and this is something that Knut Jakobsen, um, a Scandinavian scholar sort of pointed me to in verses, in the verses building up to the description of Ashtanga Yoga, you actually get a kind of paraphrasing of the Four Noble Truths of Buddhism as well. Mm -hmm. And so, the Ashtanga Marga, eightfold path as it's often translated, is actually the fourth of four noble truths. And it appears 215, beginning with verse 215, going up to 229, where you have the actual listing of the eight limbs, is doing something quite akin to working its way through the Four Noble Truths. Yeah. Now, it's interesting to note, um, Mujastics pointed out that there is the use of a kind of eight-stage or eight-limbed framework found in Ayurveda. Yeah, and the Charita and more, Sangita. Yes, yeah. So, yeah. Um, which points to, or, you know, e evokes the larger discussion of that I think has largely centered around Buddhism was the this idea of dividing, you know, the truce into four parts actually an appeal to a kind of medical framework or medical model. Mm -hmm. And likewise, would this eight have been a way of talking about a kind of pro a medical kind of process or a therapeutic process? If you look at the Four Noble Truths, for example, you might say you're looking at a kind of diagnosis based upon a symptom. So, you have a symptom, suffering. Mm. You have a, a diagnosis. Um, you know, there is a kind of process, an arising, something causing this. Third, what what's our best outcome? What is the prognosis of this? And then lastly, how do we, you know, what's the course of treatment? What's the prescription? Which correspond, mm. again, with that the first noble truth of suffering, the second noble truth of the cause of suffering, the third of the cessation, and the fourth being the path. So, yeah, I think um, that's exactly what Patanjali is doing. Uh, I think that's really quite clear. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And the problem, likewise, for for the Buddhists uh, and for Patanjali, the problem is dukkha, mm -hmm. suffering, uh, and then how to how to eradicate it. Here's the prescription. Here's the here's the remedy uh, for mm. for potential. That that's how, as you said, um, that's that's the context in the sutras for for how Ashtanga Yoga is laid out. So, go back, yogis, read the sutras before Ashtanga Yoga, so that you know why Ashtanga Yoga is being prescribed. Uh, that context is is really important, and certainly in like yoga teacher trainings and that sort of thing is often left out. Um, I mean that. So much is left out. Yeah, it's, <laughs> oftentimes, it's tough. It's oftentimes, tough. and we should say this actually, oftentimes Ashtanga Yoga becomes representative of the entire Yoga Sutra mm -hmm. and that text and tradition. Whereas it's actually it's a it's a remedy, it's a meth it's a it's a prescription that's being laid out. And it's also not the only one. There's other prescriptions throughout the text as well. Mm -hmm. But it's the dominant one, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but in order to fully understand it, you do really have to understand the philosophical context in which it's situated in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so early Buddhism, Patanjali, they were really drawing from a very shared ascetic yogic ecosystem, 
Mm. Um, or perhaps we could say better, Patanjali is drawing from one in which is already very firmly established, um, and then you know adding to that and and really making his stamp. Yeah, and I was going to add to that though. I think one stark contrast in some respects is this is the focus on the the recitation of the mantra Om, for mm-hmm. example, which. I think is one of the very direct linkages between Patanjali's system and it, rather than the Buddhist materials, the more Upanishadic, the late Vedic, yes. the the priestly ascetic traditions. Where yeah, the, Om, the Ishvara, the Ishvara Pranidhana connected yeah. to, to Om. This is definitely the the more Hindu, the more Vedic imprint, right? Yeah, absolutely, and and I think you know, one of the things actually that was quite edifying about going through the material in preparation for the course here was I got to revisit some of these Upanishadic passages centered around the mantra Om, and it just really reinforced for me how profoundly important Om is within the Upanishadic context as both a representation of that rea- that sort of ultimate reality one is striving for that sort of underlying sort of breath or spirit of all things, but also the way it is viewed as pragmatically perhaps the supreme tool Mm -hmm. for contemplative practice. And so um, I I know, for example, uh, Finian Girdi has done a course for you on OM, and I've been sort of watching his... That's what's coming to mind here, because Finn and I have had so many conversations about this, and he's writing his OM book. Yeah, and to not sound too recursive, I listened to the podcast that the two of you did oh, cool. with you know, that was that was the very first uh, episode of the Yoga that's Studies right, podcast. That's right. That's cool. And it and it's it's just really exciting work. And yeah. in one of the conversations I've had with him, you know, we sort of I think came together on agreeing that the role of mantra in general, and Om in particular, is often not really fully appreciated within the sort of critical historical sphere of the study of yoga. Yeah. Um, and it, which is funny because it's a bit out of touch, I think, with a kind of modern practice of yoga in which Om often mm. figures quite prominently um, and is a kind of just sort of an intimate part of the web of yoga practice. That's um, true. I think, though, yeah. in general, the role of mantra, not only within um, within the kind of priestly and Hindu forms of yoga, but also within Buddhist and Jain forms of yoga, is extremely important. Um, but for Patanjali, that uh, Ishvara Pranidhana meditation and recitation of Om seems like one clear and powerful link between the kind of Patanjala model and the Upanishadic model. It's a great point. I think, you know, we can talk a lot about, you know, what aspects of contemporary yoga are more new, which ones are more novel, uh, that that don't have as much historical continuity or precedent in the pre-modern Indic traditions, right? There's so much discourse that's that's taken shape around those conversations, and, and, and often around you know traditional or authentic yoga and this and that. And and the Om doesn't always get brought into that. It's more around the asana, right? But but as you point out, you know, so many classes. Of postural yoga today might begin or end with with chanting Om, and that really is. Although the context might be quite different, mm-hmm. and even the awareness of what the purpose of that might be might might be quite different than say in Patanjali's time versus at the hot yoga class. Although they don't, I don't think they're chanting Om at the hot yoga studio per se, mm. uh, but uh, but nonetheless that act of 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 Svadhyaya of uh, or of Japa uh, is really one of the most ancient threads uh, that we can trace back. Now, moving us forward a little bit, uh, we have this Ashtanga Yoga model uh, that Patanjali puts forth. Of course, Patanjali doesn't have the final word on yoga. There's then another, you know, almost two thousand years of history of, of development uh, to bring us to today. 
one thing that is interesting that uh, that David Gordon White has pointed out in his uh, Yoga Sutras biography, mm-hmm. he's looking into the the kind of the next period of yoga's history, which I know you've worked on quite a bit into the the Puranic mm-hmm. uh, Hatha Yoga Tantra, but in particular these these Puranas where there's lots of mentions of Ashtanga Yoga, mm-hmm. but as uh, David White points out, where the Puranas mention Ashtanga Yoga, they they very rarely, if ever, mention Patanjali. It's usually these other Vedic sages like Yajnavalkya or Hiranyakarbha who are associated with Ashtanga Yoga. So on the one hand, we have Patanjali to, to thank, you know, for codifying and, you know, really making famous and the success of this Ashtanga system. And yet within the Indian tradition, it almost seems like he doesn't get the credit for Ashtanga Yoga. Mm-hmm. It does seem mm-hmm. to be attributed to other sages. Is this something you've thought about at all? Or what, what do you make uh, of that? Are, are, are they different Ashtangas or what's mm-hmm. going on there? Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is something we're going to be talking about quite a bit in the course. And so I don't want to give too much away, yeah, but, fair uh, enough. but I think there's so much to be said about that. And, and one part of it is, um, I've actually spent quite a bit of time reading Puranic materials, and especially with an eye to Ashtanga Yoga, but not only looking at the sort of larger context of the valorization of yoga. Um, in some respects, you know, there's a kind of peak yoga element to some of the Puranas where where there are people, you know, ascetics running around practicing yoga with all sorts of different powers and abilities, etc. There are these didactic portions of the Puranas that describe exactly how yoga practices to be performed. But also very importantly, gods like Shiva are referred to as Yogeshvara or various titles that represent their mastery of yoga. And they really embody the wisdom and the power of yoga in very powerful ways. And so, um, if you look at the Puranas like I do as one of the key repositories of really how Hindu thought and practice developed over the course of the, everywhere from the early centuries of the common era till well into the medieval period, it really gives us a snapshot of yoga as really having just permeated all of these different levels of yoga from the sort of grassroots to the most sort of sophisticated notions of gods and goddesses. Now, it is interesting to note, as you said, Patanjali is not referenced. Um, you have, for example, Yoga Shastra or Yoganushasana. Mm. You know, the Yoga Sutra begins, Atta Yoganushasana. So if there's a reference to Yoganushasana, especially with, in the context of talking about the eight limbs of yoga, there's at least a wink, wink reference to this sort of yeah. classical model of yoga. But as you're saying, Patanjali is not really discussed at all. In fact, I've never found his name within passages related to Ashtanga yoga. Yeah. And that follows a larger pattern, I think, within the late classical and medieval era of ascribing either, either just talking about the eight limbs without referencing any particular author or referencing Yajna Valkya or Markandeya. Yajna Valkya may be referenced in part because there's a text that appears somewhere probably around the, the between the 10th and 13th century called the Yo- Yoga Yajna Valkya yep. that uses an eight-limbed framework that may have been more familiar to people. At the same time, I want to point though too to there was still an elite priestly philosophical tradition associated with commenting on Patanjali's yoga, which arguably had less of an impact on the larger, you know, you know, dissemination of Ashtanga yoga. I think the Puranas are probably much more effective vehicle for that. But nonetheless, you still had a kind of elite, you know, priestly core who were writing commentaries well up to the dawn of the modern era of yoga. So it's not like it was gone from the record. And in fact, I think Jim Mallinson has argued that if you look at um, some of the 
documentation about manuscripts, uh, Sanskrit manuscripts appearing in the early 20th century, which was documented by a ashram in India, Kaivalya Dhamma, which is known for being very, a, a sort of a mover and shaker in terms of hi the history and philosophy of yoga. There are actually a significant number of manuscripts that uh, address, you know, the yoga shastra. Mm -hmm. They may not be anywhere near the number of some other forms of discourse, but it was still a kind of living tradition of discourse on some level. But the bottom line is you have a kind of splitting at some point of the kind of elite philosophical tradition versus the kind of more pervasive and perhaps popular tradition in which Ashtanga Yoga is perhaps a bit more anonymous, but nonetheless is perhaps the most important framework for thinking about yoga that is addressed and utilized in texts you know, throughout the late classical and into the medieval period. So, yeah, I'm going to stop there. I yeah, could yeah. say more. Um, it's a topic of great interest to me. Absolutely. So, a uh, couple more, couple more things here, and then we'll 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 look ahead to the course, and and we'll start to wrap up. Uh, the the Ashtanga, the eight limbed uh, mm. system, is is also not the only unga yoga system we have. Uh, if you look at uh, Mallinson and Singleton's Roots of Yoga, they've got these great charts near the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see there are, you know, four-limbed systems, five, six uh, is a very common one, Shud Anga, of course, many different Ashtanga yoga systems, all the way up to even 15. There's a 15-limbed uh, yoga system. Um why do you think the eightfold system and Ashtanga Yoga in particular was so successful kind of over the long durée, you know, mm -hmm. of yoga's history? And then let's kind of, we'll, we'll kind of then start to feed into the present and, and thinking about the ways that it's being applied today. That's a great question. And um, it's, it's, I think, a complicated picture. I mean, I think part of it is that, in that kind of classical era of consolidation, Patanjali's uh, framework for yoga became extremely influential within the context of, of a kind of resurgent priestly Hinduism. Um, and that kind of, I think, set the ball in motion for that kind of framework to become a kind of popularly disseminated framework. But you're absolutely right. There are other limbed yogas that are mentioned. You know, we just talked about the Puranas. There are other Puranas that mention five limbs, for example. Um, in the Shiva Purana, which we'll be talking a little bit about in the course, there is actually a mention that yoga is either six-limbed or eight-limbed. And it lists the six, but then it goes into much more detail in the eight. Mm -hmm. And so it acknowledges that in the broader Shaiva context, the broader context of sectarian traditions focused on Shiva, a sixth-limbed yoga was quite well-known and popular. And in fact, those two, I think the eight-limbed and the sixth-limbed, become the two kind of main competitors in terms of yoga traditions. And um, I think really in terms of the development of tantric texts, both in the Hindu and in fact, also in the Buddhist tradition, you have increasingly a gravitation towards a six-limbed model. Um, whereas in Hatha yoga texts, you kind of have a mix of eight-limbed and six-limbed. In fact, I'm, try I'm trying to think, I think there's a text, I want to say the Siddha Siddhanta Padati, which actually includes both. <laughs> you know, here's the eight-limb mm -hmm. system, here's the six-limb system. Mm -hmm. um, recognizing perhaps the authority of the eight, even if ultimately someone chooses to follow the six. Now, the relationship between the eight-limbed and six-limbed system is a really intriguing one and, one, and one of the issues we'll be looking at in the text. For, among other reasons, there's one version of the, the six-limbed yoga which looks pretty much like the eight-limbed minus yama and niyama. Mm -hmm. So one might ask the question of why would you drop yama and niyama from the picture if you want to, you know, develop your yoga? Is it because 
For example, one argument would be yama and niyama have too many associations with priestly culture. Mm. And so if we want to broaden the scope of this, let's drop the practices that people would associate with Brahminical priestly culture. Um, so that might be one idea. On the flip side, you also have, and again, this is something we're going to be talking about, versions of the eight-limbed yoga that expand certain portions. So it's very common, for example, in late medieval and early modern traditions to see 10 yamas and 10 niyamas. Mm -hmm. So those get expanded. More broadly, though, I think we see these various ways of adapting Ashtanga yoga to fit what's going on at the time. So, for example, in the Puranas, I think you really see important hints of the development of devotional traditions, bhakti, as well as tantra and hatha yoga, or at least proto-hatha yoga techniques being framed within this larger eight-limb system. So, there's a lot of interesting dynamism going on. There's clearly some argumentation and dispute going on between systems. Um, and in some cases you have, you know, let's say everyone from the philosopher Shankara all the way to the tantric philosopher Abhinava Gupta, if not embracing the eight limbed, at least acknowledging that system's import and saying what its benefits and limitations would be. So it's a, it's a complex yeah. but interesting story. Yeah, the text I'm working on, the 15th century Shiva Yoga Pradipika, it kind of mixes all of those things. Uh, it uses Ashtanga Yoga as its primary scheme or, or blueprint to, to map all of its yogas. It equates it with Hatha Yoga, uh, and then it frames the whole thing as bhakti and puja ritual to Shiva. Hmm. Hmm. It is interesting, though, thinking about what you're saying, because it is a Shaiva text, but it's a Vira Shaiva text. There are tantric influences, and yet it's also quite removed from that kind of earlier, more classical tantric period. So it, it, it does not teach the Shadanga, right? They've chosen to use this more, um, for lack of a better word, classical model. Mm -hmm. And yet they flip Dharana and Dhyana. There's a mm -hmm. specific Virashaiva twist. <laughs> and for particular reasons, I think, uh, in the way that the practices are used within dharana and dhyana yeah and i would say along those lines i think you see similar things in terms of the way shadanga yoga functions where you don't necessarily see that sort of building block this precedes that in the same way that you see in ashtanga yoga or you see you know what would be otherwise as steps in the ashtanga yoga ladder turned the other way, indicating a different way of thinking about the relationship between those practices. So when we look at this full history, it's quite obvious to the observer that Ashtanga Yoga has adapted, has changed, there's different texts that draw upon, say, Patanjali's model, or maybe Hiranyagarbha's model, and, but then they'll, they'll change out elements, and maybe instead of five uh, yamas and niyamas, there's ten of each, and, and maybe those, those uh, particular elements or practices are different, right? So adaptation and change is constant throughout Ashtanga Yoga's history. Mm -hmm. We've already touched on this a bit at the beginning, but maybe you could just say a little briefly, what are some of the kind of key ways you see that Ashtanga Yoga continues today and some of the, the ways that it's sort of been changed or innovated? Uh, how, do you, how do you view Ashtanga Yoga today? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, one, one sort of key element when I think of especially modern or contemporary yoga is this, this move towards a kind of more universalizing vision of the practice of yoga, where it sort of transcends any kind of religious or sectarian identity. I mean, I think you see that language being adopted, for example, by Iyengar in his introduction to Light on Yoga, which really uses the eight-limbed framework as a foundation for his explication of really yoga of all times, of all eras with an emphasis on the kind of universality of that practice, the universal applicability. I think, and then we also, I think, you know, we have, you know, what might be called sort of post-lineage yoga, 
where you have people sort of intellectually engaging with yoga, not out of a sort of sectarian perspective, but more out of a an attempt to really integrate it into their spiritual life. Um, and so one example, which we'll touch on in the class, is Deborah Adele's book on the yamas and niyamas mm. that really wants to look at this as a kind of engaged sort of philosophy of life. Um, you know, another author we'll touch on is Michael Stone, who wrote a book called Yoga for a World Out of Balance, which was really about thinking about the way in which yoga philosophy, and particularly the yoga yamas, can be thought of as not only a vehicle for personal transformation, but also for a kind of engagement with social and environmental issues. That, you know, yoga shouldn't just stop on the mat. You know, we should be engaged in things like green yoga, sort of green our yoga practice, not only practice in a more environmentally sound way, but step off the mat and lend our voices to these critical issues of our time, um, like climate change. Um, so there's all sorts of different, you know, threads. Yeah, I mean, you know, at one point, actually, I talk a little bit about the framing of Ashtanga Yoga by the Wanderlust organization, which runs these well-known festivals. There you see Ashtanga Yoga finding its way into a kind of popular culture on a level that is linked to, but still in some respects, being presented, linked to tradition, but also being presented in a very novel way to a novel audience. Fantastic. All right, let's let's take a, a a peek now at the course itself. Uh, I'm going to try to share my screen here. Can you see that? Okay, I can. Yeah. All right, wonderful. So, eight limbs of yoga: history, theory, and practice of Ashtanga yoga. Uh, we've kind of already hit on a lot of this today, uh, but maybe just briefly, kind of. Sh- give us a little tour of the structure of the course and kind sure. of what, what students can expect. Again, you know, not too much detail, because I think we've already hit on so much of this stuff already, but walk us through the course a bit. Yeah, so when I teach, I like to just really get right into things. Like, I, I want students to come out of their first class session having a sense that they've really engaged with the material deeply. There's material that they're taking away and sort of new new ideas and new questions. And so the course is actually going to start by zooming in right on that classical tradition, looking at um, the, the classical context, Patanjali's development of Ashtanga Yoga within the context of the Yoga Sutra or the larger Yoga Shastra, which is the Yoga Sutra plus its principle and or other commentaries, um, and just really hopefully come out of that class with a very clear and coherent sense of what the eight limbs of yoga are and how they're represented in terms of how they're practiced and what their benefit is within this classical context. Once we've got that frame in place, then it becomes much easier to kind of turn back the clock and see the ways in which, you know, Vedic or priestly traditions, whether they be the kind of ritual traditions of early Vedic practice or Brahminical uh, Brahminical asceticism that appears among other places in the Upanishads, as well as Buddhist and Jain practice, how they all provide elements that are building blocks that Patanjali draws together to create his systematic presentation of yoga. So by having that framework in place in the first, you know, through that first module, we can then go back and see those direct linkages between these earlier practices and the classical model. So having done that, we'll we'll return back to that sort of classical framework and then jump forward and we'll look more at the broader classical context for the development of yoga. And by that, I mean particularly the epics, the Mahabharata in particular, and the Bhagavad Gita, which is, of course, part of the Mahabharata, as well as the Puranas, the literally the stories of old, uh, 
that are the repository for the sort of key Hindu narratives that really carry down to this day, as well as key didactic or teaching portions that tell you how to do things like practice ritual or practice yoga. We'll look at the, the larger development of uh, Vedantic philosophical traditions that also in many cases embrace Ashtanga Yoga, as well as Jain traditions. Uh, one of the things that many people uh, who are familiar with Ashtanga Yoga through yoga practice aren't aware is that not only is this a tradition that has a profound impact on Hindu practice, but also on Jain practice. And then the the a large part of this unit will be dedicated towards looking at the way in which medieval traditions of bhakti, medieval traditions of tantra, and then ultimately hatha yoga um, spin many of these different elements associated with ashtanga yoga, either embracing it in whole or in part. Last, we'll sort of use that foundation then to look at modern ashtanga yoga. And so <clears throat> we'll not only look a bit at David White's work, which he sort of made famous in this text, uh, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, a biography, arguing that much of the appeal to Patanjali in the modern era is a kind of reconstructionist uh, effort. Um, we'll also sort of touch base on Mark Singleton's work. He actually wrote a, a paper on what he calls the classical reveries of modern yoga in the way that modern yoga has appealed to this classical vision of yoga. Um, from there, we'll look at the inf a number of different influential early gurus, including Krishnamacharya and his disciples Iyengar and Patabi Joyce, who all champion the framework of Ashtanga Yoga as a modern yoga framework, um, but also Swami Shivananda, some of the more contemporary but very powerful and influential gurus like Swami uh, so-called Baba or Father Ramdev and Sadhguru Jagi Vasudev. And then lastly, kind of bring it into this larger cosmopolitan and transnational context, looking at the way in which people have engaged this as a kind of spiritual practice or as a kind of social and environmental ethos within the more contemporary context. And so I really hope everyone will come out of this class with just a profoundly solid knowledge and understanding of the limbs of yoga, but also its building blocks in the pre-classical era and the way that it has been transformed as it's developed over the course of the medieval and modern eras. And really, you know, if, if nothing else to understand that these systems of yoga are living systems that develop, that are dynamic, that are being transformed, and that this, that the idea of finding a way to make the eight limbs make sense in a kind of contemporary mode of practice is, is something people have been doing for generations. Mm. Fantastic. So the course is YS-121, Eight Limbs of Yoga, History, Theory, and Practice of Ashtanga Yoga. It's going to run live from July 11th through August 5th, 2022. Uh, at the time this podcast will release, uh, enrollment is now currently open. So please join us. Uh, if you're watching this in the future, uh, after the, uh, this course has aired live, then you can still join us. Everything has been recorded, uh, and you can take this as sort of a self-study course on your own. So thank you so much, Stuart. Uh, that was a fantastic and fascinating conversation. As always, I feel like we're always just scratching the surface, and there's there's so much more to, to go, and uh, that's, that's what we'll do in the course, is we'll continue to kind of go deeper into each of these uh, topics that we've, that we've brought up today. Uh, any other final thoughts or, or, you know, reflections as we kind of wind down here? You know, nothing really jumps to mind other than to say that, you know, I really appreciate having this opportunity to share this material. This is a, a labor of love for me, a topic that I've had a deep and enduring fascination with. 
Um, we are in the, our conversation here just scratching the surface and hopefully we'll be able to take it a bit deeper in the course. And um, I really look forward to sharing this information with everybody. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you so much, Stuart. Thanks uh, to all of our listeners, uh, our viewers, uh, for making it this far into an episode here at Yogic Studies. Uh, and uh, yeah, we, we appreciate all of you and, and hope to see uh, many of you uh, in this course. So thanks again, Stuart. We'll be in touch here very soon. And to everyone else, thank you and please take care. Thanks so much, Seth.